好酷。嗯Excellent. Okay. And I think we can begin now. Okay. Excellent. Okay. So, hello. Um, I'm David Porter, and I'm going to be talking to you today about um, data storage and workflows and how um, they can be best achieved here at MSI, and especially for the kind of workflows that are both data intensive and um, compute intensive. I'll be giving examples of how to do that and um, discussing all of the tools that we have available. If you're interested in following along, there is a tiny URL at the bottom of this um, screen here, https slash slash um, z.umn.edu, and um, it's 44JN. is a simple little URL you can go to uh, to uh, get a, co um, a link that will give you a copy of these slides if you'd like to follow along or have a, a copy that you can keep for your further notes, future notes. So um, I'll start with sort of a hierarchical overview of uh, data storage as it exists today, a very high level overview of the hardware and its constraints and, then the si and how that's integrated into systems, uh, both across um, generally across the University of Minnesota campus and then more specifically at MSI. This um, brief preamble about the uh, hardware overview is going to not be new to many people, but I like to um, start with it for a couple of reasons. One thing is that it establishes a namespace that we can refer to um, and in terms of the, the modern nomenclature. And also, um, it highlights what the hardware limitations are and what the state of the art is today. And those limitations are really important in this discussion because those limitations are what hamper your workflow and your throughput. Your, your capability of looking at the larger data sets as well as how fast you can analyze them will, uh, to a large extent, be determined by these hardware limitations. And a big takeaway from this uh, tutorial is how you can work within those limitations to best effect and how you can um, actually greatly improve your workflow by, an informed, by informed decisions of how and where you process your data. And I'll show you options for that and illustrate just how much faster you can run when you orchestrate your workflows in the right way. And then if there's time at the end, um, there'll be a hands-on. So one of the Simple guiding principles here is that when you're talking about data intensive workflows, there is a, always going to be a memory hierarchy that you're going to be up against. And um, it goes from within the CPU itself um, on CPU based architectures, or even if you're using a GPU, it's going to be the same kind of a deal where you have a GPU or a CPU that actually does the processing and it has a relatively small amount of register cache um, for um, immediately ac uh, accessing the data, which runs the fastest, but is the smallest in capacity and is the most expensive per byte. Uh, next tier up is uh, like some kind of a caching system uh, on processor cache or on processor me or on GPU memory equivalently. And then there's going to be the system memory that's within local to a node that's immediately accessible to either a, a GPU or a processor usually. And then beyond that, you have the local disk, shared disk systems, um, and going out to tape drives and the um, wide area network. And in this hierarchy, the general rule is the further, away, away, further you go away from the CPU, the, the larger the latencies are for getting that first byte of memory, the, long, um, the lower the bandwidth, but the greater the capacity, the more you can store there, and the cheaper it gets for storing it. And so you 
this memory hierarchy plays into how you want to orchestrate your workflows. This is basically the same slide, except here we've highlighted in yellow the, um, the tiers of this hierarchy that, will, uh, that you can access with normal file system um, utilities. Everything from a RAM disk to, um, and memory to, um, to the local file system. Uh, they, there are standard ways you can access this with most applications. For the uh, tiers on either side of this, it's more specialized. In particular, in memory or on, in register, that's only really directly accessible from within an, a running application. And even though you'd say, well, there's not, I'm not going to have a normal file that I'm going to be pointing to that's in the register cache, in the register memory or the cache, of a, um, of, a, of a CPU, you can still choose the size of the um, unit or unit of work that you do, and you can orchestrate them to fit into, say, a memory cache and get much uh, better throughput that way. So there actually are ways you can take advantage of this hierarchy beyond the normal file system to improve your throughput, and we'll be discussing that to some extent. Now, the, all these file systems, the normal file systems that uh, you would, uh, that we normally think of, are all oftentimes disk-based. So you have SATA disks, SATA drives, and SAS drives. These are the two principal technologies available today. And they are comparable in their capacity and bandwidths, however, the one, point that I want to bring up here is, in particular, that the mean time to failure for any one of these drives is typically in the, uh, on the order of a million hours or in the millions of hours. And the salient point is, is when you run a center like MSI, you don't have one of these drives spinning. You have many thousands of them, tens of thousands of them in principle, uh, in the larger file systems. And um, so that mean time to failure um, for actually goes way down. And so when you start managing file systems that are on the petabyte scale, you really have to, you're not really buying storage, you are renting storage in the sense that you need to have an ongoing budget for maintaining the storage that you already have. There is going to be a finite rate of disk failures and you need to maintain a staff that's on the ball for um, replacing those drives as they go. Because even if you use a rated system, you can lose one drive and continue to use it, but you lose the second or third drive, and eventually you'll start losing data. And so you really have to maintain these systems. And as a result, there has to be a budget that goes along with really large file systems. And that plays into our policies for how we um, allocate disk space. You can't just give it away for free. There's a real cost that we have to pay for that. And for that reason, we can give individual groups um, disk storage for, for free up to a certain limit that fits within our budget. But anything beyond that, we have ways that you can, you can pay that will help us maintain those systems at, at, on a larger scale. And that's the reason we have to rent spa disk space once you go past a certain um, limits. Typically, user groups are allocated 10 terabytes at most. Um, and if you want much more than that, then you need to um, basically pay. And it's a nominal rate, but you're really paying for a service, is what it really amounts to. Similarly, we have um, SSDs, um, solid state devices. And these are much more expensive on a per byte basis, but they give you much lower latency and higher bandwidth, typically, than spinning drives. And um, they're very good for um, being near the front end of many file systems for the caching part of those file systems. And so all of our um, larger file systems will be enabled with these SSDs. You don't need to worry about this. This is running under the hood, but this is part of the technology that's available today in general, and we use it in our solutions. Beyond that, and this is something that most people don't think about when they think about 
file storage is that you can actually use the memory of the machines for at least temporary uh, file storage. And I'll actually illustrate workflows that take advantage of this. All of our Linux file systems have a share, basically what amounts to shared memory, as we call it, um, across the processors that are local to that node. And um, it can be used as a normal file system, which gives you the best performance. Of course, the restriction is it's going to be the only local to the node that um, is using it, and it will, um, it's, most, it's the most limited in capacity. Basically, most of our systems are configured so that you can use up to half of the memory of the machine as a file system while you're using that node, but you're sharing that memory with other applications. So if those applications fill up the memory, it's not really, that memory isn't available for a file system. So you have to orchestrate this with the application. S nevertheless, for many codes, you'll find the best performance will be achieved if you're accessing the files off of a RAM disk. And then beyond that, this speculati speculation, the uh, what will happen next. And this slide here is only here because in truth, the um, file system you see today will be different than the file system you see tomorrow. The technologies are always changing. And so um, uh, new file systems are in the offing, so we can hope that capacities um, will improve and, and bandwidths will improve as time goes on. But that's very speculative and we have to live with what we've got today when we talk about um, the, um, the problems that you're facing with this year's research. Now on top of this technology for the slow level drives and SSDs and even um, RAM um, disk memory, you can build um, systems on top of that. So you have the, the devices like um, ma uh, block storage. Um, this is what is the most typical file system that you're going to come across on most PCs as well as here at MSI, it's what you're probably going to start with for staging your data. And you build on, on top of these block devices, you have a variety of file systems that can be um, built. Uh, uh, there's uh, PanFS is the, or, or Panassis is the file system that we've chosen for our home directories, for our, all user home directories. And um, this is a parallel file system and it is a very functional and very resilient and built for the kind of a, a system we have here where we have hundreds of nodes and th thousands or tens of thousands of um, cores all simultaneously accessing the same file system. PanFS excels at that sort of, in that sort of an environment where they can all symmetrically access the same file system. This has very nice properties for you as a user here at MSI because it means that you can stage your data under your home directory and then access it from our HPC clusters or any of our um, Linux or Windows front ends for um, interactively working with your data. And that can lead to some nice solutions for some workflows that I'll illustrate in some of the use cases at the end of this um, tutorial. And then on top of these file systems, you can build services. And there's the, the common um, web-based services, or as well as the services that we support under Linux. Questions so far on this? OK, this is pretty standard stuff. Um, now, this factor of 10 chart here uh, basically um, illustrates in terms of numbers, the, this uh, memory hierarchy that I was referring to, going from, um, from uh, cache memory and um, local memory on a node through local disk and, um, and to, out to the wide area network. And these factors of 10 um, were actually harvested from a conference back a, um, a few years ago, a national conference. And I like to show this. And I, uh, this same slide, because these numbers, to within an order of magnitude, haven't moved very much over the last few years. 
So this is sort of where the technology is in terms of the number of files you can have on the file system or in a given directory. Typical file sizes that you might be limited to um, and the bandwidth that you can get. I will actually, I actually have another table that's much more specific to the resources here at MSI that I'll be delving into later, um, which will show you what this uh, memory hierarchy looks like in much more detail in regards to um, a compute node on our flagship system, Masabi. Um, and they, those, those numbers are actually real measured numbers that you can achieve if you uh, orchestrate your workflows um, correctly. But this, these factors of 10 um, are a ballpark of what you can get in principle. And they underscore the fact that these are fundamental hardware limitations that we're up against. You just can't assume that you have infinite capacity or infinite bandwidth for accessing your file system. You have to live within real constraints. And those constraints will dictate how fast your workflow will go. Um, and a big point of this tutorial is to illustrate how you can work with this cache hierarchy and get the best possible throughput. And then beyond bandwidth and beyond capacity, there's also data integrity. And that's another thing that you typically will get at a, um, a computing center like MSI or any of the national centers that you don't typically get on your own desktop. And that's resiliency or redundancy. Uh, so that you know, if you lose a disk, you don't lose data in principle. And there's a variety of ways of doing that. You can mirror the data, so that w that's just a factor of two replication of the data. And whether you mirror it on disks or on a tape storage system as we have here, you just make two, two complete copies of the tape. Um, this will reduce your um, error rate quite a bit so that whether it's a disk or a tape, if you lose one, you still have the other one as a backup. A more sophisticated approach is rated file systems where you have parity bits. And here you might just have one or two or usually at most two disks reserved for uh, uh, redundancy. And then you might have a set of four or seven disks, depending on the RAID, um, that will uh, uh, be, you know, that, that, um, uh, that you spread your data over. And so basically, um, the RAID systems will use a set of disks and scramble the data around in such a way that there's redundancy so that you don't have to have a complete separate copy, but you can lose any one disk and you have enough information to replicate the lost bits. And this can be done in all kinds of really advanced ways on the file system level or in objects, in object-oriented systems where you um, have replicas of objects or partial replicas spread across in different tiers of a hardware hierarchy that supports a monolithic file system. So in block storage, you might just have a single RAID um, and um, you have parity bits across that entire RAID. But then if you lose a single disk, you'll, um, you have to restore that disk and it might take some amount of time depending on the size, the capacity of that RAID. And the larger it gets, the longer it takes it to refresh. And this is an effective limit on the size of RAIDs because if it takes longer to refresh a RAID and replace that disk than um, the, failure, the time to failure for a disk on that RAID, then um, you can't keep up with the failure rate. So this is a practical limitation on the size of block storage. And for that reason, really large file systems like Panassas are more sophisticated. They'll actually have a layer of object storage buried in there. You do not have to worry about this as an end user. You just see a POSIX compliant file system that um, will support all your applications and shows it to you as one monolithic volume. And so you don't have to worry about how it's implemented under the hood, but all that resiliency is built in there. And that's part of the reason why um, these, a lot of these parallel file systems like Panassas um, are relatively expensive per, on a per byte basis. 
because you're paying for all of that resiliency. Um, then there's also snapshots. And um, this is a, a completely different kind of resiliency that basically saves you from yourself. Um, and I have been saved by this from myself quite a few times. What it is, is it's a, a backup, an incremental backup of your home directory and, and, and all of your files that are on Panassas, except for the scratch directories. Um, and it, you have a, a daily backup, an hourly, daily, and weekly backups that you can roll back to in this incremental um, uh, archive. And what it means is you can corrupt a file or accidentally delete a file. Or you could be editing a code and not saving your changes. And then all of a sudden you realize you don't have a good copy to roll back to um, that you, you kept track of. Well, you can save yourself by going back to last night's copy. Or if you actually delete a file or a whole directory tree, you have that um, um, available as well. And so this is very nice for recovering from user errors. And people, you rarely use it, but when you do, you're really grateful that it's there. And that's one of the nice things that we have on our, um, uh, on for all of our home directories. And then finally, there's tape backups. And we do have a tier three storage, which I'll be talking about in some detail. And this allows you to choose the files that you want to um, save and back up, and they can be stored to tape. Now across the campus, there are, is going to be a variety of environments that you'll come across for um, storing data. It would be on your departmental level, um, and that'll be up to the department how, what kind of resources they can afford and want to provide for um, department members. Um, there is uh, the OIT, Office of Information Technology, here at, on campus. Um, and that, they're, um, they're really great for document level, your, um, desktop and document level um, storage. And in fact, and we actually use that qu quite a bit here at MSI for quite a lot of our official documents, um, working on uh, um, spreadsheets, as well as presentations. This presentation, in fact, is being shown off of OIT's um, Google Slides. And so and it's just a, the nicest place for me to develop a, a presentation, share it with other people, and then and present it, whether I do it here or anywhere on campus, or across the network, in fact. Um, then MSI, we have our own kinds of storage, our, basically our home directories, Tier 2 storage, which is an object-oriented storage, which we'll talk about Ceph, Ceph-based. And then Tier 3 storage, which is the tape archive. And then um, also there's the library, has its own kind of drum storage for um, its archival, its kind of archival storage. And then, of course, you have your own desktop or laptop with its own file systems that where you interplay with any of these. And each one of these um, different kinds of file systems have their own particular properties and what their, um, their own regimes are where they're particularly good. Not surprisingly, where Emma, the niche where MSI fits into this game is um, the, the high performance end, both large capacity and high bandwidth for storage. That's where we really excel and uh, that's um, uh, where we can be enabling for people's research. Um, our tier two storage is fairly, we get quite a few checks across the board. What a lot of people don't realize is that you can actually get as good or better bandwidth off of the tier two storage than off of the um, primary storage, the, the home directories. We call the home directories high performance storage, but it's shared across many users and many um, applications that are running on it simultaneously on all of our parallel platforms. So there's literally, at any one time when the systems are up, there's literally tens of thousands of clients or individual applications that are all hammering on this file system and you're sharing the bandwidth that way. And they can be doing very highly fragmented I.O. with the result that 
the slice of the overall bandwidth that you get by, is greatly reduced compared to what it in principle could be if you're the only user on that system. By contrast, the tier two storage um, is designed to um, access data in larger chunks. And in fact, you can really only access um, individual files by file going directly to that file system. So this means that applications can't directly read or write to it, but you can access that data, pull it and stage it in a workflow much, much faster in, in real life than you can um, with just about any other kind of file system. It has the capacity, it has the bandwidth, and because it's somewhat restrictive on how you access the data, it, gives, it can give you effectively much higher bandwidth. And I'll illustrate how you can um, take advantage of that. But it also, the tier two storage, checks off quite a few other boxes here in terms of the um, other attributes like sharing data across campus um, or sharing it with other users or accessing it even off of your desktop. There, since it's a, a object oriented, a modern object oriented storage system, it actually, um, you can expose URLs off of this um, storage system and then access it as a, a website. Though it's not, doesn't fully support all of the bells and whistles of a web server, you can access it, um, access data through URLs and um, and that gives you another way of um, getting at your data. There are also desktop applications you can run that um, will allow you to, to see what's on our tier two storage and access it in all kinds of different ways. So I'll be pointing to that documentation. One of the final categories that is still really a work in progress is protected data. Um, here, there's a lot, uh, we are working on putting together systems, uh, both computing systems and storage systems that are compliant for um, the regulations for protected data, like, like for example, HIPAA compliant. Um, but this is definitely a work in progress because you get into all the regulations which are much, much more restrictive and also a moving target. And so we are working with the powers that be to enable um, access and, and utilization of protected data on our systems. But they'll usually have to be on completely different systems in order to satisfy all the regulations and, and access to them is much more restricted. Now the glue that holds all of this together across campus is our networks. And we have the standard one gig E network that's been around for quite some time connecting all the departments and the centers here on campus. And that's shown in red here. But the um, a new development is this Gopher Science Network, um, which is a dedicated network specifically for high performance computing and scientific applications. Um, so you're not sharing it with everybody going onto the web, browsing, going to YouTube, and streaming music or videos. And you're not sharing it with a very highly fragmented access with just you know, hundreds of thousands of other users. This is a network that's designed for much higher bandwidth and it's 10 giggy at least. Um, and it will connect not all, only interested units on campus. Um, so if your department or lab is interested in this, please contact us because we want to connect up the campus where it makes sense on this Gopher, Gopher Science Network, but it also connects um, to the wide area network at higher bandwidth, to other compute centers and data repositories. Um, and so this, this will, um, is actually exists today and is available to you and will be immediately available if you're using MSI systems and you're going to a data repository that is on this um, second um, next generation internet. Um, but if you are the unit on campus that wants to enjoy this higher bandwidth, then come and talk to us to see what your data needs really are and to see um, how we can set you up. So that's the general um, overview. 
and, um, and the resources that are available across campus. And what I'll start talking about next is more specifically the resources here at MSI and how you can take advantage of them. But before you um, do that, you want to ask yourself some, a few questions before you start orchestrating your workflows. You want to think a little bit carefully about how you're going to access the data, how the data is broken up, what kind of applications you're going to be using to process it, and basically all the questions that go into defining your workflow. Um, and not all the data is equal. And different kinds of data and different kinds of workflows will obviously need different solutions. If you have questions about any of this, the consulting staff here at MSI is very happy to help. I'm one of the people who can um, help you with that. But generally, you would send email to help at msi.umn.edu, and we'll get a consultant tied up with you to dig into what your workflow is and, and talk to you via email, phone calls, or direct consultation um, to help you uh, get up and running and using our systems to best effect. So we'll get into storage at MSI. But I have one other preamble which underscores a couple of points that really are pervasive and under, um, underlie um, much of the content that follows. Basically, we are here to help. You have the real data and problems and needs for your, in your workflow. You also have the justification for uh, the reason why we're here, because we are here to enable you to uh, take your uh, um, research efforts to the next level when it comes to high-performance computing or data or memory-intensive um, workflows. So you have the real data and the needs, and we have um, the, the resources, hardware, software, and the expertise on how to use these um, hardware resources. Um, and so if your needs are vast in any respect, in terms of really huge data, or uh, compute-intensive workflows, or very complex data that needs perhaps some assistance in looking at, we're here to help. We can help you with that. And the idea here is that if you can already do your work on your own laptop, then you're probably best off just continuing on using your laptop, because it's going to be more effort on your part and on ours to set you up with an account here at MSI. But if you have large data needs and you, they, um, and you can't get it, uh, satisfactorily do it with your desktop or even your departmental resources, then that's what MSI is here for, for enabling those larger applications. Um, one other point, and I think this is, this is also very pervasive when it comes to HPC computing, is we are all in this together. Now, that's a nice platitude, but I find that it has extra meaning in a high-performance computing context. And this is something that's lost on a lot of people. We don't have a zero-sum game here in the sense that if you find a solution that helps everybody, the first person that you help is yourself. And the reason why is, is if you have a truly high-performance computing um, workflow, then you're going to be stressing one of the parameters of either the data-intensive, memory-intensive, or compute-intensive parts of it. And if, they, if you're doing that, then that means your application alone is going to be stressing the entire system. If you take the approach that you're just going to try to get as big a fraction of the system to, to, for yourself or your own research group, then you will be limited by the current design of your workflow, and you can't go beyond that. What's more, as you expand to use the entire resource, because you're bottlenecking on one of those components, you're not taking full advantage of the rest of it. So if you're, band if you're bandwidth limited, you're wasting CPUs. If you're disk limited, you might be wasting bandwidth and CPUs. The upshot is, is that the, um, you're then squandering your own research group's service units by not 
um, designing your workflow the most efficiently. And you end up bottlenecking everyone else as well. By contrast, if you try to uh, find more efficient workflows, then what you'll find is that um, you can, uh, your, your throughput will go way up because you, um, um, you're now using all the different resources more in harmony in terms of balanced and getting more out of it so that you're removing the bottleneck and you can uh, run faster even if you're not using the entire resource. But either way, the first person you help by making, uh, by making your workflow more efficient is yourself. Because by definition, if you're stressing the resource, when you're running, then you're taking up the entire resource and you're bottlenecking yourself. And so by making your own workflow more efficient, you can run much more, you, your throughput goes way up and then you're using the resources much more efficiently. And the more users we can get on board with this, the better it becomes for everyone. And the reason why I'm really hammering this one point home is the biggest single limitation for people getting um, th a good throughput on our systems is people doing highly fragmented I.O. on that shared file system. They're shooting themselves in the foot and they're taking everyone else down with them. They can immediately get better throughput themselves by using some of the techniques I'll be talking about here, by using the RAM disk, by using local disks, and staging their um, workflows to, be, to not have to access the, the shared file system all the time. And as a result, the first person they help is themselves, and then the more users we get on board with this, the better it becomes for everybody. And even if they're the only person doing highly fragmented I.O. on a shared file system, they would still improve their throughput tremendously, and I have um, the numbers to support that, which I'll be getting into in my use cases. So that's what I wanted to comment on, is that there, we can make a very big difference by just thinking a little bit about how you orchestrate your workflow here. So the resources, the specific resources we have in terms of um, storage um, is we have, of course, the, um, the shared file system, um, uh, the tier one storage, uh, which is your home directory, supports your home directories, and that's off Panassas. Then there's the tier two storage, um, which is an object-oriented storage, which I'll be getting into how you access that. Um, and um, you have much larger capacity there you know, whereas your group might have a total of a few terabytes on home, home directory storage, tier one storage, you have 120 terabytes per user on tier two storage. So much larger capacity and a little straight ways you can um, get much better bandwidth and throughput off of it, in fact. Uh, then there's tier three storage or tape um, drives, um, and that's for uh, your archival backup. Then uh, we also support things like databases um, and database services, though that's on a per project basis. Um, and then there's local disk and RAM disk. And I'll be talking about each one of these in turn, the different properties and how you can use them to best effect. So for the shared file system, the PANFS, it's a POSIX compliant system. And what that means is, is that it will support all your standard applications. So commercial applications, community codes, um, software that you write yourself and build with Fortran or C, all the scripting languages like Python or MATLAB. It supports all of those equally well and in the same way that you would see it work on your desktop or laptop. So it's a very familiar kind of file system and essentially all applications nowadays are written to, um, to um, talk to a POSIX file system. So what I think of the, um, uh, the directory system, this tier one directory system, which your home directories are under, not so much as high performance file system, but as a f the most flexible file system, the most functional file system. It's the, one, the first one that you'll go to because it is so flexible and easy to use. 
Um, and then only when you start getting bottlenecked in terms of throughput do you want to start thinking about the other file systems. The, it's visible on all of our um, computing platforms, both Windows as well as Linux. Um, both the front ends and the remote desktops like NICE and NX, as well as the login nodes, um, as well as the um, high performance compute nodes and that you would run in batch. They all symmetrically see this file system. And that's a really nice property because it means you can set up and stage data, uh, define uh, scripts and uh, batch jobs, and then just submit it to our batch queue and you don't, there's no replication of data, no copying data back and forth. So it's very functional that way. Um, its persistence is basically the lifetime of your account at NSI. Um, and the way um, you would access it, as I mentioned, is since it's POSIX I.O., all the standard applications work on it. Under Linux systems, you have your standard utilities like LS and CP you know, for copy, LS for list, um, the, all the standard file system commands. And virtually all applications can just immediately read and write to it. The namespace looks like this, where you, um, it's very uniform across all user accounts. They're all under home. Then the next tier is the group that you're in, that this will be the name of the group. And then um, for home directories, there'll be several di directories underneath the group directory. You'll always have your own home directory and that'll be your username for um, the, uh, the name of the directory there. Uh, there will be both sh a shared and public directory that's also under the group account. And uh, the shared, as, it, as the name might imply, um, is the, for files that are shared among your user group. And so this is, this is for files that you want to keep private within the group, um, within your PI's domain, but, uh, and you don't want to share necessarily with people outside your group. So it's a natural place to put files like that. But you, want, you, it's, you, you, pl you place it there so other members of your group can see those files without having to go into your home directory. Um, the public space is a nice place to share data or applications across all of MSI. I use it under my account to share solutions that I come up with that are of general interest. So examples of how to use software or, or file systems I'll post under my public space. Um, <clears throat> it's a nice place for users to post issues for MSI consultants to look at um, like if you have an example that either breaks our system or is not running the way you would expect it to run, if you can formulate that into a few files in a script, you can put that into the, your public space and then share that with MSI staff and that way we don't have to get into your home directory. Now if you're okay with us getting into your home directory, then we can dig into there or if you have it staged on some scratch space, then we can look at it there. But this gives you a way of sharing data across MSI for whatever reason, across different groups if you're collaborating with other groups, for example. The limitations then is that you have a per group disk quota on the, under your home directories and that's shared across all users in the group as well as your public and shared disk spaces. It can be no more than 10 terabytes um, that's a hard restriction we placed on all groups and you have to justify it in order to get up to that level. We have good solutions if you get into multi-terabyte data sets and you can fairly easily justify the need for 10 terabytes but we don't go beyond that on a per group basis. Tier 2 storage is very different. It is an object-oriented store and it's implemented with Ceph in our, in our instance. Um, and that object-oriented store is very different from what you see under your home directories. Here you access data by file or by object as they call it more generally. Typically an object will map to a single file that you would place there. 
Um, you can store files or you can free them one file at a time or directories at a time. But you can't run an application which opens one of these objects, seeks to a place, and reads from it without very special software that's, um, and it's not normally done. Typically, and it would have to stage, it, all that software does is stage a copy of the file locally so that you can access it in more standard ways. Um, the, so the, the purpose then of the tier two storage really is to um, store much larger volumes of data and access, which you access it in much larger granules, basically. So the granularity is much larger on tier two storage. Um, it, it's, again, the, the lifetime is the lifetime of your account, and it's visible on all of our um, HPC platforms. Um, there are um, simple ways you can access it um, in terms of uh, the S3 CMD commands, um, which I'll illustrate. And there's also web-based ways of getting at it, through, which you can look at through this link. Uh, which has a lot of documentation on how you can, from your um, Mac or Windows laptop, access directly the uh, files that you have stored on um, Tier 2 storage. The namespace is, um, as is typical with object-oriented storage, is you have a, um, a bucket name, and then inside the bucket you have objects. So think of each one of these objects as a single file, basically. Um, the bucket then is like a directory, but you don't have a directory hierarchy that's natively supported. Many applications will mimic a directory hierarchy. So there's a, there's a lot of applications you can run that will copy whole directory hierarchies to tier two storage, and then they will make bucket names that, that one bucket per directory um, and, the and it will look like you have a directory hierarchy there, but it isn't natively supported by all the applications that you run on tier, on tier two storage. You'd have to use special applications in order to recognize that syntax to treat it as if it were a directory structure. It isn't really a directory structure on the tier two storage. You just basically have buckets and um, objects in those buckets, which are individual files. Um, Let's see. So the limits then um, are an allocation on a, on actually on a per user basis. And so are the permissions are all by on a per user basis. And um, basically you can store up to 120 terabytes on there. So it's a much larger volume. Tier three storage is tape. Basically, it's a tape, ar tape archival system. And here you have to pay up front even for the first unit. And it's really intended for the kind of use cases where you need to archive data for a few years. Um, and that fits into many data plans um, and requirements that many research, um, uh, much research funding has. Um, you typically will get six to 15 terabytes, depending on how well on a, on a, t a pair of tapes, because you buy them in pairs. And that's for uh, redundancy, so a re it's a redundant backup, a, a mirrored kind of approach. And, and there's compression. So depending on how much your data compresses down, you'll get anywhere from six to 15 terabytes per tape pair. And the cost is, um, you know, around 450 per tape pair. And um, that isn't as, you'll note that that's more expensive than, for example, a USB drive. But here you're not just getting tapes, you're getting a service. And it's really renting that service because those tapes are on a tape library that will automatically um, stage the tapes. But even more importantly, you'll have a listing of everything you put onto those tapes and a way of accessing any of those files that you put there by name. Um, you don't get that um, necessarily with um, some raw storage devices. 
if you have a USB drive that you've copied terabytes onto and is now sitting on a shelf not attached to anything, you don't necessarily have a listing of what was on that drive unless you implemented it yourself. Now you can save it what you um, saved on there with your own software and maybe your own files, but then you're responsible for maintaining that mess and then also finding that USB tape drive on the shelf. And if you get upwards of beyond 120 terabytes, um, which you have for free on tier two storage, you'll find yourself with lots of USB drives sitting on that shelf and it becomes a logistic mess keeping track of it all. What's more, there's a finite time to failure with those USB drives and a finite failure rate, even the second time you go to use it. So if you get enough of those drives, you're gonna be finding for yourself, and I've worked with many users who have done this, that you'll be losing data. <laughs> and so um, it is a solution, it's a cheaper solution, but we don't officially support it. Depending on what you're doing, you may want to do it, but we don't officially support it because we aren't going to take on the responsibility of managing an ad hoc system. We've implemented a system which has a cer certain, ad adheres to a certain standard of reliability and usability that we're comfortable in supporting, and it's for the whole group, so we've amortized those costs. But ad hoc solutions like a USB drive, you're on your own for that. And you can do it, but it's, you're gonna find that it's, you're gonna be spending a lot of your own human time um, dealing with it, and it's not gonna be worth the salary for it, typically. That's, that's what we would say. So that's the reason why, even though it's a little bit um, more expensive, like a factor of a few more expensive than USB drives, what you're really buying into is a service here. You know, beyond that, and I will just um, quickly go over these uh, topics, we support databases, but this is on a per project basis. This is uh, very labor intensive for our staff. And also it's resource intensive because when you stand up a database, it's highly available. The intent is for it to be highly available. It's always there and ready to be accessed. And that is a quality of service that is not necessarily in keeping with an HPC resource. HPC means high performance, not 24-7. Um, so this is a very different kind of a setup we do do it to a limited degree, but you typically, it has to be associated with a, a well-defined project with a, with a budget, and, that, and part of that budget would go to MSI for supporting the database, because it really takes staff time in order to stand up the servers and maintain them. However, you could be in a research group where, you're, where there's already an existing database, um, and then you would just be accessing it, and oftentimes it might be in a, a database that has already been um, implemented by MSI. And you'd use normal web-based applications through a URL to access it. Um, typically, if it's a database that's supported at MSI, it would start off with MSI in the root name of the URL, um, and then beyond that, it would be specific to the project. And the limits on this is basically it's by the, uh, according to the project for the size, the bandwidth, and the, um, the uptime. Now, what is always available to you for free is um, local disk. And that's going completely in a different direction. Rather than being always available and visible everywhere, Local disk is only visible on the node that where that disk is mounted. It adds, um, so its visibility is only local to the disk and the access to it has a scope that's only local to either your login to that node or the job that you're running. Because if you run another job, it'll probably be on a different compute node with a different um, local disk. And so you need to stage your data, copy inputs out to the local disk, process it there, and then copy output back out if, you're, if you want to use this as a solution. It can be worth it depending on your application. And I'll be getting into the numbers there 
um, in my um, real use cases. Um, but it is POSIX compliant. And what's more, this is more like a standard file system that most applications have been written for. And I mention that because most of your commercial and community codes will typically do highly fragmented disk I.O. And that works fine on a local file system where you'll have something like file system cache that hides the fragmented I.O. In other words, you jump to a byte and you read one byte or one word, and a whole page will get cached in locally on that, um, uh, from the file system into memory. Then when you go and read from that same page again, it can come from memory and it goes very, very fast. And so uh, many applications will run just fine on a local file system, and then they'll be very slow on a parallel file system like Panassas, where because it isn't local, this all of the way you, it implements file system cache are very, very different. And as a result, they can be run much, much slower. So many applications will run much more efficiently if they're data intensive and disk access intensive by going to a local disk. And that's one of the reasons why I like to point out that local disks can be a good option depending on your application. Um, the namespace looks like this. So this will be the same on every single um, Linux node that we have at MSI. There will be a scratch local um, partition and then under that, you can, um, would typically want to create um, something with your username to distinguish your, um, your use with um, of that disk with anyone other, any other user if they happen to be sharing that disk. So that keeps the namespaces clean. And then you'd have a path under that depending on how you wanted to organize your data and your individual files. The limits on this is are typically about 420 gigabytes on a local disk. Um, and that's true for both the um, different kinds of disks. We have SAS disks as well as um, SSDs. The SSDs operate the same way, but they'll be higher bandwidth, and it's an, an attribute you can actually ask for in your job. Then there's RAM disk, and this is using the memory off of your um, on the node itself. Again, it's a POSIX compliant file system, and this is going to give you the best bandwidth and the lowest latency of any kind of file system you're going to find because you're coming straight off of memory. So you don't have the hardware limitations of a spinning disk or even the, the small lag you might get off of an SSD. This is coming straight out of memory, and nothing, can, nothing will beat it. The deal is, it's, um, again, only um, visible to the local node, and so it's, its persistence will only be over the lifetime of a job if you're running it, if you're using an, a compute node within a job. Um, but you would use it in all the standard POSIX compliant, compliant ways, so any application can run off of it if it fits. The namespace looks like this. So there's da slash dev slash slash SHM, and so that's the path to the local RAM disk on every single node. So it's always the same name. And then under that, you'd have some kind of a path that you'd create, and um, oftentimes with your username, and then the files you want to work with. The limits here is that it will be only up to half the memory of the node that you're using. A typical Masabi compute node has 64 gigabytes of memory, and so you can use up to 32 gig on a, um, on a RAM disk on one of those compute nodes. However, again, you're sharing that memory with other applications that are running on it. So if some application needs to use the entire memory, then you don't have any RAM disk left to use. So you need to take that into account. So that's the trade-off with using a RAM disk, is principally the capacity and the fact that it's only visible on that node. Now here's this uh, memory hierarchy specific to a Masabi compute node. Um, and these are real numbers. These are numbers that I've been able to reproduce with real applications, not just synthetic 
applications for measuring bandwidth, but in real applications. Um, and they are close to the protocol, have the absolute not to exceed speeds um, that the hardware can produce. So these are real numbers in the sense that you can really achieve them, but they are very close to the actual practical limits that you can get on this kind of hardware. Um, and it goes all the way from the local memory and, and cache to the local memory to the RAM disk, um, local disks, um, and uh, tier, two, tier two storage. You know, your shared and um, tier one, tier two storage, um, and out to the wide area network, I include. Because some workloads actually go out that far. Um, and these. Um, capacities really do reflect the limits on what will fit. And, the, and I like to have this as reference. Certainly, there will not be a test on this. You don't have to memorize it. But these numbers are good to have in mind or have reference to when you're work designing your workflow. In particular, if you can design, run your application so that it fits in this memory cache. So if, you, you, if you've got an entire node to your to in your job, if you can fit your application in that 60 megabytes that's available on a on that cache, you will find that it runs amazingly faster, much faster than even if you're going from memory, because most real applications are memory bandwidth limited. The truth is, CPUs can process data far faster than um, they can access memory in the sense that you typically need to do on the order of 50 to 80 to 100 floating point operations in order to pay for the time that you, it took to pull in a single word. In other words, if you, if you pull in a word, you need to do something like 80 operations on that word before you pull in the next word, or that's the ratio you need in order for the memory bandwidth to keep up with the CPU on one core. And on Masabi, you have 24 cores. And um, um, something like eight memory banks. And so you, the number of cores outnumber the, uh, the memory lanes going to memory and the memory banks. The upshot is virtually every application is very heavily memory bandwidth limited. And that data traffic limitation actually is a limitation at every tier here. And that's the reason why these capacities are important, because the, the smaller you can divide up your unit of work to fit into a smaller chunk of memory, the, the faster you can get your application to run and the better throughput you'll get, assuming that you do more than one thing with, the, um, with each word and you need to go back to it again and again. Most, most applications will work that way. So this allows, what these memory capacities allow you, do, you to do is to design your workflow in such a way that you can take advantage of the superior latencies and memory bandwidth at each tier of this hierarchy as you go in towards the CPU. And of course, the way you go about accessing that memory or that data is different depending on the tier of the hierarchy. If it's memory or cache, it has to be in process, like I say. But you can still control that by defining your workflow so that an individual application has a memory footprint that fits in that size. And you'll typically get that. If you're writing the application yourself or you're controlling, you can configure the application, oftentimes, you can make your working arrays fit into cache, and you'll see a, a big boost in performance that way as well. For the tiers of memory or data that fit into the, either from RAM disk on up to um, uh, the shared file system, <clears throat> they're all POSIX compliant, and so you'd use, be using your normal disk I.O. You'd be staging files on that level. And then beyond that, you're going to things like object-oriented store um, for your workflow um, or even URLs, pulling it off. And so um, this is something to keep in mind um, when you're designing your workflow. 
Questions on any of this so far? Okay, so the specific applications you would use then to actually access all these tiers of memory um, include, I have a short set here, which I'll be reviewing. You can use secure copy type commands for copying data onto or off of our system. Um, WGET for downloading um, data that's been staged appropriately on the internet. Um, there's Git repositories, and the university has a good one for sharing source code and even moderate sized data. Um, there's the S3 CMD commands, which are command line, is the command line interface for accessing tier 2 storage. Actually, tier 2 and tier 3 storage. Because um, you can write directly to the tapes using this. And then finally, there's Globus, um, which is a very powerful way of accessing data. Um, and moving data, migrating data between centers and, and across multiple platforms. So the examples I'm going to be giving here will assume that you're logged into MSI on one of our Linux platforms. And in order to do that, you need to go through, if you're going from off campus, you need to go through the university's um, VPN. Um, and then from there, you can log into one of our bastion hosts, as we call them, either login.msi.umn.edu or an NS NX desktop or um, uh, a NICE desktop. And so we have a variety of Linux platforms you can use. So the first example um, with uh, secure copy, assuming you're logged on to a, an MSI host, then um, you can run an SSH command. Um, and it's always organized so that it has the, the source to the um, destination. And so if the, the source is from a remote site, assuming that it supports the SSH protocols for, um, from the outside world, you can then specify your username on that remote host, and then a path to a file. Um, on the remote host. And then you can specify just the path that's local um, that will copy it to the local file system. Similarly, um, you can copy from MSI out to a remote file system by flipping that order. And both, both directions will support a recursive copy. S SCP will take a fl various flags, one of which, lowercase r, stands for recursive and it will recursively go through a hierarchy of directories. And it's a way you can copy an entire directory tree or folder tree from one system to another. So very simple. Um, next, we have wget. And this is great for downloading um, data that's been staged on the internet. It's a pretty, pretty standard command and very, very simple to use. You just do wget and then give it the name of the URL that corresponds to the data you want to download. Um, it assumes that the data has been staged in such a way that that server will allow you to do this. Um, but many data repositories, um, software repositories, will, will, will facilitate this. Then there are GitHub um, type repositories. Um, and the university has a good one. Um, here's a pointer to the root name of, uh, that you would use uh, for your um, accessing um, repositories on the University of Minnesota GitHub. And there's some excellent documentation they have posted. I won't get into the details here. There's a ton of documentation and a ton of use cases for this. Um, but you, there are also Linux command line utilities um, for merging and um, adding um, data to a repository and so forth. Then there's Ceph, which is our tier two storage. And we have an S3 interface. Um, and the Linux command for accessing that is S3CMD. So this, again, is good for accessing and managing larger volumes of data and they're doing it a file at a time. Um, I've gotten as good as 1.4 gigabytes a second um, by doing parallel streams with S3CMD. 
Um, so you can get very good bandwidths off of this, especially if you do things in parallel. Um, the commands look like this. Well, there will be an S3CMD, and then you, for example, would do MB for make bucket, um, and then give it a, um, a bucket name, which, and the syntax here will always adhere to this S3 colon slash slash and then bucket name. Um, there, this is a common namespace for all users, by the way. And so typically you'll want to formulate bucket names that include your username, that will start with your username to help guarantee that it will be unique. If you choose a bucket name that someone else has chosen already, then this make bucket will fail and it'll tell you that it already exists. Um, and so typically to keep the namespace straight, what I recommend is you just incorporate your username as the first, um, as first string in the bucket name and then you can put anything after that uh, for having multiple buckets. Then you can copy data to and from it with a get or a put and, it's, and the get and put is relative to the Linux host that you're running the S3 CMD command on. So a put will put data to the tier two storage from the local disk that you're running the S3 CMD on. And a get will conversely pull it from tier two storage onto local disk. And we have uh, a lot of good documentation on, on these commands as well as web interface commands that will allow you to see and uh, manipulate and control your buckets and data um, from your laptop or your desktop. And it, it interfaces well through a browser and is fairly um, OS agnostic. You can run it from any operating system. Then there's Globus. And Globus is one of the most powerful ways we have of moving data around, and, and especially in bulk, in large volumes. Um, it has all the semantics that I would want for moving large volumes of data. It's the kind of thing where you can define a very large volume of data to be moved in a simple, single simple command and then submit it basically to be run in the background. And so you don't need to stay logged in or attached while it's running. But it will give you, whenever you want, um, a progress report on how far it's gotten. Um, there's a way of um, finding the uh, progress that it's made, as well as it will just email you um, when it's done with a very large transfer. What's more, it does checksums and it will validate the transfers as it goes, so it's very reliable. And if the network goes down, as it typically will for all kinds of reasons in a really big transfer, it knows how to do retries. And so it will reliably and robustly move very large volumes of data, no matter how complicated they are. And so that's um, all the features that I would want for, um, or many of the features I'd want for um, data migration. Um, the, to use it, you would uh, need to uh, basically use your, you can, all users at the U of M have access to Globus. We have a site-wide account with the Globus um, uh, consortium. As a result, um, all user IDs, you would use your user ID at the U of M to authenticate in and use Globus. So you don't have to create a new account for that. You can use your already existing U of M account and just your normal internet ID. You then um, register data endpoints and, um, and then you can set, set up transfers. And you would start by um, going to the, um, their um, website. Now, the look and the feel have changed quite a bit um, since I posted, uh, originally made these um, slides. The, the number of files has increased tremendously over, um, over the years. And also, they've completely changed the, the, the look of the website the functionality is all still there and the semantics for how you use it is still there. The, the fields are in slightly different places and the look has been updated, primarily because they support many more ways of accessing data, including like from data repositories and things like that, as well as web services through Globus. 
Um, it's very, very, very flexible. Lots of different things you can do to it. I'm only going to be illustrating just migrating data here and basically corresponds to data transfers um, under the new um, framework, syncing or transferring data. Um, you would start by going into login. And so the, even though the look and feel of the page is different, they still have a login site. And the um, first time you would go in, you would um, need to select um, the domain that you're running from. And you'd go from the University of Minnesota to authenticate in with your U of M ID. And basically, that won't be populated immediately. You'd go to this pull down and see an incredibly long list of domains. But all you have to do is start typing University of Minnesota. And before you've gotten to the MIN, you, it'll have um, selected University of Minnesota. You then select that and continue. And then you'll bring you to your U of M Sibboleth for um, authenticating in. And the, even this, um, we've changed the look of our Sibboleth since I posted this. But it's exactly the same thing. You'd enter in your U of M ID and your password, the same password you use to log in at MSI or get at your email through OIT. And then you would, um, now you're presented with a much more general interface. But by clicking on transfer or syncing data, you will get an interface that's close to this. And in particular, functionally, you would do, you'll be doing the same thing. You'll um, select um, an, uh, and start entering in an endpoint. And you'll need an endpoint for um, a source and a destination. If you, so you start, say, with the source. And for example, maybe that'll be your home directory at MSI. And so this is the name of our, this is the unique name for the endpoint at the University of Minnesota MSI's home directories. There's also one for tier two storage and there are another one for tier three storage for tape. So you can access tape and tier two storage through Globus. But for the home directory, you would enter in this endpoint and basically what that does is it filters it down to the, uh, uh, an endpoint that you can then just click on. And that brings you, if you haven't authenticated to and activated this endpoint already, you would then log into MSI one more time, same ID and password. And you only need to do this once every time you need to activate an endpoint. Once it's activated, you don't need to do that again. And then you can see the list of of files and directories under your home directory. You need to do this again for um, the uh, destination. And here I've entered in the one for physics, uh, the uh, physics department. And, um, and they have a much smaller directory tree out there. And um, I'm going to illustrate how you use it with a simple example, a very start off with a very small example where I have this directory hierarchy where I was using a uh, computational fluid dynamics application called OpenFoam. Um, and um, I use this to illustrate it because it's a small example, only you know, a small number of megabytes, and um, hundreds of directories and thousands of files, and a very irregular directory tree. Um, so basically, I had all these different test cases I ran. Inside of each test case is a typical setup for how you run OpenFOAM in terms of how you define the problem and the system and the solvers, as well as the sets, with the, which are basically the data that's generated. And the sets are broken up into some number of, um, uh, here are, these numbers correspond to time steps that I save data at and then the post-process data within them. And so there will be different numbers of files and different numbers of directories in each stage of this hi hierarchy in principle. So leading to hundreds of directories, thousands of files, but just a small volume of data. Only about you know, 0.6 gigabytes. To set up the transfer of all those thousands of files, all I need to do is browse to the directory called pipe here, that I want to send. Uh, browse to or enter in a directory where a destination path on the, on the other server, the other endpoint, and then click go. 
you will get this ephemeral um, notification that just basically confirms that you clicked that button and have actually started the transfer. But then you can also go to looking at activity. And then you'll see the list of the uh, transfers you've um, initiated. And by the time I got around to um, going to this page and doing a screen snapshot, um, it had already completed. It completed within three minutes. And that's because it was such a tiny transfer. When I look at the statistics of it, I, it, it actually counted for me the folders and direct, um, files that it transferred over and the total volume of data. It did not achieve a very high bandwidth, only you know a few megabytes a second. But it did it all automatically. And it really didn't matter that it was a low bandwidth since it was such a small volume of data. It still did it in a few minutes, and it did it all automatically and checked everything as it went. When I looked at the um, larger transfers, where I didn't have such highly fragmented data, like sending 200 gigabytes um, and that's split across 32 files here, I got 80, 80 megabytes a second to the physics um, uh, endpoint. Now, it turns out that physics endpoint isn't provisioned with a lot of um, compute nodes, unlike centers might have. So that was actually a bottleneck on the physics side. But you know, it's, it's just a local departmental system. So they don't have the budget for really big servers, it's something that they could put together inexpensively and affordably for them. And it's certainly functional enough for what their use cases. Going to another center like NCSA, where they have a well-provisioned um, endpoints, I've been able to see over 300 megabytes a second sustained transfers. So you can get really good bandwidth on really large data transfers with this. And when it's done, it'll send you an email um, with the statistics confirming that it's completed. And if for some reason it's running into ongoing problems, like for example, one of your endpoints has become deactivated, so it's tried many times and failed, it'll send you an email saying that it's run into problems and making progress. The nice thing is, typically what'll happen is that it's only that because a, an endpoint maybe was timed out or unavailable for a while. As soon as the endpoint becomes available again, as long as you've kept the um, transfer, you know, active, um, it will keep trying until it finally succeeds and moves everything across. And it will keep track of where it was at. So if you have you know, thousands or even millions of files to move, um, this is a great way of doing it and keeping track of the progress as it goes and automatically completing. So that's, that's a very nice property for many use cases. So questions on this so far? OK. So finally, I get into um, some HPC workflows and, um, and some use cases that illustrate how you can use um, MSI systems to good effect. This first one is very simple and really corresponds to um, the case where many people run into, where you have a complicated and distributed workflow where you have different environments. Like you might have one environment for setting up the problem and another environment for doing the compute part of it, and maybe a third environment for looking at the data afterwards. That's the case I had here with this commercial software, ANSYS software, which is engineering software for doing um, engineering type problems. And, and it supports multi-physics. And so you might have really complicated setups that do computational fluid dynamics, thermal problems, electrostatics, chemistry, a variety of physics all coupled together in a complicated geometry for real, real world type engineering problems. The setup of those problems is, can be very sophisticated because you have lots of things to choose between in terms of the kind of chemistry that's going on or the geometry of the problem the properties of the flow. And so they have very advanced graphical user interfaces for supporting that. These interfaces are written for and primarily supported on Windows. And they run great there. They're fast, they're reliable, they're, um, they run very smoothly. 
but they are very sophisticated, and the third-party ports that they have, the Linux, are very fragile and very slow by, com by comparison. And so the sweet solution is you want to be able to set up the problem on a Windows system. And that'll be true for many kinds of applications um, that are, especially those that are graphical user interface intensive, because they'll oftentimes only be written for Windows or run best under Windows. By contrast, the Windows platforms aren't that great for parallel computing. It's, it just have not been scaled up and worked out in most systems. And in particular at MSI, all of our HPC resources are under Linux. The nice thing is with the Panassas file system, you get to get the best of both worlds because your home directory is visible to the Windows systems as well as the HPC platform. So you can use the Windows systems to de define your problem or look at it after the fact, and then use the HPC systems to do the actual compute. And so you're using the best properties of each in each case. And the glue that holds it all together is the Panassas file system. So that's a simple use case, but especially for like the ANSYS application, I've got many users of that, they, re they really benefit from this. Now, for the data intensive workflows, the, that same Panassas file system can be challenged. As I've been mentioning, that shared file system is shared across tens of thousands of clients, many of which are doing highly fragmented I.O. As a result, even though in aggregate it has a fantastic bandwidth, the, the bandwidth that you, an individual application sees is greatly reduced. In order to get the best throughput then, um, you want to take advantage of some of the other tiers of our um, file systems, including, uh, as this um, example will illustrate, RAM disk on one side for doing the compute part and, and, and circumventing the, the slowness of the disk access, and on the other side for capacity using the, the tier two storage. And then I will show how this can be done in a fairly automated fashion. But before I get to that, and this is really relevant to this, many, this is not just one class of users. Many users ran into this problem. In fact, it was such a problem with users filling up their um, storage, uh, the storage under the home directories, because that's the simplest and first one they use that many groups were ex um, using so much disk capacity that we realized we couldn't continue to afford it. That's when we put in, imposed the policy of restricting things down to 10 terabytes. But in order to be good to our users, and in order to make it work, we needed to talk to the individual users group by group. And I chose some of the most data intensive users for this. And I put together a short little tutorial, a mini tutorial, on on the workflows for dips, in particular data intensive workflows where you are way exceeding 10 terabytes. How do you manage that? What do you do? And the one takeaway was if you're going to store data, the only reason why you want to store it is because you're going to use it. And so if you, you really need to think about how you're going to use that data um, when you go about organizing how you store it. In other words, you need a data plan. And this next slide reels, reads like a sales pitch, and I'm not going to apologize about that. This really is a sales pitch. But I am not selling a product, and I'm certainly not going to make any money off of this. The, I, what I'm really selling here is an idea. And the idea is, is there is a better way to access your data. And I'm serious about each one of these sort of flashy points here. My goals in, co in, in coming up with a strategy for people to um, um, look at their data and define their workflows is I really wanted it to be easier for them to use some of these automated methods than it would be what, with what they were already doing. In other words, doing each thing individually by hand versus having scripts that could automate the workflow. Um, I wanted to make it reliable. And part of this is that if you're 
have a fragmented personal workflow like I do, you have many projects you're working on. You have other things that are distracting your attention, and you're not always going to back to one directory with one data set. That means that after a week, you may not remember where that path was, or you might have a hard time finding the data again if you've been working with three or four or ten different data sets and, and your life is fragmented. What's more, directory paths tend to be friendly for the machines that they're running on and not user friendly. And so it's very nice to have a, a namespace that's meaningful to you personally or you and your collaborators in terms of na a namespace that's relevant to your user discipline, whatever that is, biology, medicine, physics, engineering, as opposed to the arbitrary names that system administrators came in, with these long path names. And so I wanted to come up with an example and a strategy where users could refer to um, the data in a namespace that was meaningful and customized for them as opposed to imposed on them by the uh, uh, arbitrary file system. And finally, I wanted it to be flexible in terms of how you maintain, migrate, share your data, working with other users or going across multiple platforms. So I'm serious about each one of these words. And I have an example that works for one class of use cases. I don't even recommend that you use the software I've written up front. It will depend on your data, the kind of your data. If you do computational fluid dynamics that's time dependent, and saving individual snapshots like I do, then it might be a perfect fit already, right out of the box. But most people are going to have very different kinds of data. And what I'm really selling here is not so much a particular implementation, but a strategy for how you go about approaching managing your workflow. And, that, and when I codify what that strategy is, it really comes down to a hierarchy. And it's a hierarchy in human terms as opposed to file system terms or hardware terms. And so the hierarchy I'm talking about is the very top tier of that hierarchy is multiple projects. And that project might correspond, an individual project may correspond to a thesis project, um, uh, some team effort working on a paper, or that's um, some funded research. So you get to define what that project is. The project is broken up into multiple data sets. And each data set would correspond to whatever the nature of your data is that, um, that you, in the organization that you like to think of it in terms of. So if it's a computational fluid dynamics simulation, one data set might be all of the output from an individual fluid simulation. If you're a biologist or a, in the medical field, that might be patient data from an individual, like MRI uh, series of MRI scans on a patient. If you're doing genomics, it might be a given genomics data set from uh, samples from different individuals. Um, then each data set, and this is the crux that helps uh, the data flow, is I, I'm assuming that you can break it up into some number of items. And there's complete flexibility of what these items are. The notion of an item, though, is that it defines a unit of work to be done. So this is where you need to think a little bit about what the nature of your data is and what you're going to do with the data so that you have a subset of the data that's small in, fra but in comparison to the overall data set, but large enough to define a useful piece of work that can stand alone in part of your workflow. Now, if you're doing embarrassingly parallel kinds of tasks like 99% of our users, this is really easy because they're just doing the same thing to a whole long series of data. And, um, and then it's pretty easy to break this up. But I argue that even if you're doing really complicated things that re require global information, the, the, the entire data set, it's still useful to break things up into pieces because depending on the kind of analysis you're doing, oftentimes you can define the work of doing some global kind of comparison in terms of some number of tuples of groups. So for example, if you're doing an autocorrelation 
of both the data set against itself, you can achieve all the pairwise comparisons of whatever they are by divide, dividing up the entire data set into some number of chunks and then pulling in each pair of chunks. And then if you can enumerate through every single combination of pairs that way. And this allows you to then manage your data and manage your workflow in a way that can be run in parallel, as well as distributed across more distributed memory systems and um, or run serially as well. And so it, um, it, it, there's a lot of advantages to enumerating your, your, the item, uh, some kind of items in your each data set. Then finally, each one of these items doesn't necessarily correspond to a single file. It might have, be, have several files associated with it, and I'm calling them names because those files might exist in multiple places. You may have them backed up on tier two storage. You may have a copy of them on another data center, or they may be the source of them may be from some data repository. So, but there will be some namespace that a, a given kind of workflow will usually adhere to so that the name of the file identifies what that data content is. And so I'm going to make that assumption that you can um, work that into your, um, this hierarchy. Then within a workflow, um, uh, you'll want also need to keep track of some number of scripts for doing the processing and methods um, for um, what you do. And that's, this is all in the abstract. Each different kind of workflow will have different realizations of how this would be done. The example that I'm going to discuss here is specifically to illustrate how this can be done and the kind of performance you can achieve is from my background, computational fluid dynamics, where I'm looking at um, an isothermal magnetohydrodynamic simulation, IMHD simulation, and it's run on a mesh of a billion zones. 1,024 zones on a side, and I'm saving um, seven fields corresponding to the mass density, three components of velocity, and three components of magnetic field. Um, so that's, and I'm storing them at um, single precision floating point, so four bytes per variable, seven variables per zone, and a billion zones, that translates to 28 gigabytes of data. Um, for parallel I.O., uh, my code writes out this data in, in eight pieces, so it can have eight streams going at once. So each snapshot has eight pieces it's written in. So this corresponds to the namespace I was just referring to. For one item, there would be eight names or eight files associated with it. If you just look at the raw data on disk, it's going to look something like this. This is just only a small part of all of the files involved. Um, and there's um, over 650 files and about 2.6 terabytes of data for the whole volume of data. And so this is the kind of thing that you probably don't want to ever deal with by hand, file by file. You're going to want to script it somehow or run applications that sweep through this one way or another. What I wrote to facilitate working on this kind of data set to make it much simpler for myself so that I could even remember where I was keeping the data as well as automatically process it in a much, much easier fashion. I wrote a simple little suite of um, basically shell scripts, which I call available. And available is just a shell script I wrote that allows you to do a couple of things with some data sets, simple, straightforward things. The first thing is register where that data is. And the uh, semantics I adhere to for this particular example is you go into the data, a directory which has the data, and you, you just run available in that directory and give it a label. And that label can be any length, and it's a name that's meaningful to me. I just use the name of the run simulation that I did, just um, not to be too creative. But then I can optionally put in a string which describes what that is in my own terms. And then um, all that does, and this illustrates how simple this can be, is it creates a little text file that basically acts as a, sh can be sourced to set up shell variables 
that define the location of the data and default places where I might want to process the data and where I might want to save it like the tier two storage with the bucket name. The whole idea here is to minimize my effort and also uh, minimize the chance that I'm going to forget where I put the data because it's been saved for me and remembered for me within this framework. You can implement this any way you want, but I recommend something like this simply because if you have more than one data set you're working with or if you want to share the data with another person, this is a very simple way to do it. Because I don't want to ever have to type in these long strings again, <laughs> basically is what it comes down to. Then when I go to use the data, I can, for example, a week later, a month later, a year later, I can just type available and it will list all the data sets I've registered and it will give them by the label as well as the string I wrote that describes it in my own terms. Um, then I can choose one of them, the, the, they, that uh, billion zone M MHD calculation, for example, by referring to it by the label and then it will remind me the of the directory, but I don't have to type that in. I just have this um, redundantly in there in case I want to check it some other way. But I don't have to worry about that. It will also give me the description as a reminder of what I'm pointing to. And it will set up the directory where I run this for analyzing that data. Basically, all it did is it, it copied the database info into this um, data as a simple file so the scripts I use for referring to the data can reference it and, and know where everything lives and how it's structured. So to actually go and use it, one example would be to just copying it to tier two storage. And so one of the options on, uh, I have is to basically, uh, I'm running here in a shell script, is that I would run available on the, um, give it the lab, um, label to, to set up the um, um, information for the data set. And then I would run this um, available S3 sync option. And all this does is it uses the paths that it already has stored away for the location of the data, primary location of the data, and the tier two storage bucket, and then syncs the two, just going through and it will incrementally do so, so that if I run it again, it will check to see what's already been copied up, and it won't do that again. So it can run uh, fairly efficiently. In this case, since it was running on one core and just one stream going to Ceph, um, it took about almost a day to run. But it, um, but it r copied the data to tier two storage, um, and it did it in a background job, so I didn't have to enter anything more than this. Now, after that, I tried using normal S3 CMD commands to copy that data to um, Global Scratch. I was going to use this for some benchmarking. Um, and what I didn't realize when I copied all of it down is that some of the S3 commands timed out. And that was because of the slowness to these, this Global Scratch directory, which I've been referring to. Because so many people were hammering on it, occasionally the file system would pause. And if it paused too long, the particular S3 command, S3 CMD command, would actually time out. And it would then um, fail, and it would report the failure, but that was mixed in with literally thousands of other reports that it was doing, and I, it got lost in that stream. So I didn't even realize at the time that there was some missing data and that copy to the, um, uh, the global scratch space. But um, ju just exactly for this, um, case, this kind of use case, I wrote a, a simple little script that uses this enumeration of items to sequence through and find what is available where. And so it actually found that some of the files were missing on that global scratch, and by contrast, on tier two storage and the primary storage, um, they're all present. And so just by running this simple command, I could actually get an, a very simple report that told me I've got some data missing here. And it could have been finger fumble, it could have been a failure of the file system as in this case, or it could have been that I just simply didn't copy all the files over, maybe I only copied five over 
talk at at some point. This is a very quick way of assessing what is where, and it works because I have an enumeration of files. I've split it up into an enumeration that I can sequence through. So this works for managing the data in a variety of different ways. It allows me to sequence through everything and check to make sure it's right. Or it makes it allows me to sequence through everything and do one operation on it of any kind, basically. Um, so the, that's part of this illustrates part of that functionality. I like Amethyst this because this surprised me. I wasn't even realizing that I hadn't realized that this um, there were missing files there, and that just listing the directory with 658 files in it, you don't see that there's a few files missing <laughs> necessarily but this will catch it for you. And you need some systematic way of sweeping through all your data in order to see something like this. Now, for actually using it then, uh, for, uh, to just get some benchmarks and to illustrate how fast it can go, I got a job on a compute node, and I went to the local um, RAM disk, which I've been talking about, this dev SHM, and I made a DHP directory for my account name. And then I used um, this, um, ran available on this um, for this data set. So that set up the directory for analyzing this data. And then I did this, um, this get command, which um, I can get it by item number. So I don't have to type in the full name of the data, I just grab one item, because remember, these items are defined to be one useful piece of work. So one data set, one piece of the data set that all goes together that you can do something meaningful with, however you've defined your workflow. In this case, it's one snapshot, one time snapshot from the simulation, which is a natural thing to look at for looking at multiple fields and analyzing things at that one time. Um, it took about a minute to pull down and from tier two storage, and it pulled these eight pieces of, down it, in parallel. So now I had that staged, and I have some processing software that can read from it, and so I defined a field in terms of the raw fields, um, where I can define a velocity vector field, a magnetic vector field, and then in terms of those, define a kinetic energy and a magnetic total energy, and then finally a total energy, which is the sum of all of that. Um, and then there's a poor man's volume rendering where I'm just taking um, a projection, uh, orthographic projection through the entire volume. And I chose this particular field because it forced it to pull in all 28 gigabytes. Yeah, I needed to look at every single field to compute this and in every single zone in order to get this volume rendering. And as you can see, it took about half a minute in all and only about 14 seconds to pull in the data um, and so I got very good bandwidth coming from the RAM disk. By contrast, I did a similar benchmarks on different file systems, just for comparison. And so here are the, um, the timings I got off of the RAM disk versus timings from my home directory and timings from the shared file system that most people are using a lot and complaining about because, as you can see, the times for reading data can be easily 100 times longer than what you get off of um, coming from a RAM disk. And there's a large range in variation there that you'll get. And it, be, it depends on the load on the system, just how many people happen to be reading and writing to that same partition at the moment that you're trying to do this. And it's not just my application. I tried other standard Linux applications. DD stands for direct to disk. And all it's do doing is copying as efficiently as it can blocks of mem blocks of disk in sequence. It's not even doing anything with them. It's just reading them and throwing the bits away. Um, and I can chose th choose the block size, an eight megabyte block size in this case. And I could go about twice as fast as my application off of RAM disk. But remember, this is not a real application. This is just reading the data, and it's just streaming sequentially through it. Um, off, yeah, as you can see, over home directories and especially the, um, the share, you know, the scratch space, it's a lot slower. Similarly, a checksum, standard checksum, where it's just calculating the checksum as it goes, 
is much, much slower. Now, I thought my application would run pretty fast on this. I'm reading two megabyte chunks, and most disk experts will say, oh, that's a pretty good size for most um, disk block sizes. So that should be probably fairly efficient. And it's great if it's off of a local disk, but on a shared disk like this, because I'm jumping around and reading the memory primarily, um, it, it, it runs much, much slower, especially off that scratch disk. So the takeaway here is nothing beats RAM disk. Um, and that'll pretty much independent of the application that you're running. So uh, if I'm playing around with the data interactively, I, here I'm just get, grabbing a 2D slice. So this is a million voxels that I'm pulling out just in a 2D section through the billion voxel data set. Looking at multiple fields here um, for like the magnetic energy, the total energy, and the vorticity, um, I can do that in just a couple of seconds. So interacting with the data, pulling out small pieces of it, because it's all on RAM disk, it can go very, very fast and very, very interactive for an interactive use case. Now for a batch job where you're sweeping through all the data and enumerating through that entire, um, uh, you know, 2.6 terabytes of data, um, that can be done using this, this framework very easily um, with a GNU parallel command. So here I've defined a job on four nodes, and I get the list of unique list of nodes here with unique, this unique command, which I'll use here for the list of nodes that I'm going to run parallel across. This is GNU parallel. Um, it's a standard application that we have available through a module. So module load parallel will give you that. Um, and all I feed it is the sequence of item numbers I'm going to go across, 0 to 81 in this case, for 82 dumps. Um, and then it will fire off a shell script called PROC, P-R-O-C. This is a shell script of my own writing that will process the data in that one item. And I set it up, and here, here's that entire shell script. And it's set up to run off of the RAM disk. So what it does is it takes the um, item number, and it also takes the task number, which is the second argument. Let me show, go back up here, which is specifying the GNU parallel by specifying the second argument out here. And I have a, that task number basically is guaranteed to be unique. And I use that to define a directory on the RAM disk. And I'm only doing it this way so that I can guarantee that this is a unique directory for this item. And because I'm going to create it, write to it, use it, and then blow it all away at the end for cleaning up after myself. And I don't want to risk deleting a directory that's actively being used by any other task. So I want a unique name for that. And so this will create a directory on the RAM disk. And then using this. Um, because I reused the available command here, it copied in a, an information file that I can then, then just source here to set up all the variables for the paths that I need. So that all, I can just get item, and it will give it, I give it the item number, and it will just pull down that one item, whatever it was. Then I can, by item number, process it to calculate, in this case, vertical profiles, for the kinetic energy, the uh, magnetic energy, and the vorticity. So, because I want to get the profile, uh, basically the run through time of each one of those quantities. Um, and then at the end, I copy the small amount of output data, these vertical profiles, which are just columns of numbers in ASCII text form. I copy that to my home directory, a results directory that's been set up, also by in this available framework. And then at the end, I blow away the entire working directory um, because I don't need it anymore, and I've saved the data from the job to my home directory. So I'm really using all three tiers of storage here, pulling from Ceph to RAM disk, processing on RAM disk, and then copying the results to my home directory for later use. And the, the punchline is just right here. 
that I was able to process the 2.6 terabytes of um, data and did so in a very short amount of time. And I achieved an, a sustained 1.1 gigabytes per second throughput. And that's with doing real work on the data. Um, the red bars correspond to the time it, was it took to pull the data from tier two storage, and the blue bars correspond to the time it took to process. It was about the same amount of time. And I had four, um, four threads going in parallel, really four nodes running in parallel. And I really, I could have gotten this to go faster by using more nodes. Um, and the result was I was then able to take those vertical profiles and just generate the averages through time um, for each of, each of the um, variables and generate these curves. So uh, I think I'm pretty much out of time here. So I think I'll, I'll finish it up there, but ask if do you have any questions. OK, that's fine. Um, I think we'll, um, we're done for this for now. Um, and um, feel free to um, contact us. You can always send email to help at msi.umn.edu um, uh, if you need to, for special consulting services. We're very happy to help you um, with your data, use applications, use any of the resources here at MSI. And with that, I'll thank you, and that's it for today. Mm -hmm.